Good afternoon, everyone. Can I just, um, before I kick off, can I just acknowledge what an outstanding morning it's been with Shah? Can you please give her a round of applause? <laughs> We've just met for the first time today as well, and I think it's quite ironic that um, I, I'm actually uh, appearing on the slide there next to Shah because, Shah, I mean this with the greatest of respect. I don't think we could be more different. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, where were you born, Shah? Bangkok, Newey, right? Uh, where did you grow up, Shah? Newey. Um, how many slides did you use today, Shah? I got about 100. <laughs> you said before, no structure. I got tons of structure. How many, uh, how many business plans have you done before, Shah? Yeah, I'm a professional strategic planning facilitator. <laughs> so, but here's the interesting thing, and, and I think this is absolutely wonderful. We're both here for the same reason, right? We want you guys to be the best version of yourselves you can be. And we both want to inspire you to take action out of today. Is that not right, Shah? Yeah, so isn't it interesting that um, we can come from two totally different directions, and I absolutely mean that, but we're going to meet in the middle. And, you know, we've had a couple of chats today and we are absolutely on the same page. It's just that, um, you know, there's more ways to skin a cat, isn't there? So let's skin some cats. Um, so I've called today's uh, session, and, and I'm over two sessions, right? So I've called it um, Becoming Better Leaders. And um, I really wanted to thank Steve for the invitation. As Steve mentioned, we've only just recently met. But um, I get a, such a great feeling for, for uh, for the roof, from the room and, and why you guys are here. And uh, talk about, I'm not going to talk about my why or your why, but other than to say my why is to inspire people to become better leaders. And I work with people like you every day and uh, that's what gets me out of bed, if I can help you become a better leader because fundamentally uh, the world will be a better place if we have better leaders. Um, I really want to thank Steve for his hospitality um, when I, I, as he said, I drove down from Newey uh, last night, uh, I checked in and I went up to my room and I hope you can see this clearly, but here's what I walked into. Um, there's, on the left-hand side, there's rose petals. On the, on the bed, there's a big love heart of rose petals and over here, there's a little sign that says, uh, check out, there might be something interesting in the, in the fridge. So, Steve, thank you so much for upgrading me to a romance package. There's only one problem. <laughs> I'm here by myself. <laughs> I actually sent my beautiful wife photos of that last night and we had a little bit of a giggle. Um, I love uh, Wollongong. Uh, here's a couple of photos of um, some experiences I've had it with Wollongong. Every, almost every year for about the last 10 years, some mates and I who are cyclists, we complete the Sydney to Wollongong bike ride. Has anyone heard of that before? Supporting, an, have you done it? Yeah, so it's supporting an awesome our cause, which is MS. And you can see that we take our cycling pretty seriously. That's me in the Santa outfit. And I've got my little posse of elves. And over here, top uh, right-hand corner, and again, that's, that photo's not too clear, but uh, that's actually the Scarborough Hotel. So what you want after cycling 70 kilometres from Sydney to the Scarborough Hotel is you want three or four schooners to make the last 20 kilometres really interesting. And uh, here's what I typically look like as I walk into, as I cycle into, uh, into Wollongong. Um, let's talk about what today's about. This is a guy, uh, a quote from a guy called John C. Maxwell. Hands up if you've heard of Maxwell. Awesome. Uh, Steve, do you share Maxwell's stuff with these guys? Okay. No, there's lots of them who, 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 who uh, know Maxwell. Um, and, and when I was preparing for today, I, I, I thought this is a, an entirely appropriate quote for what you guys are here for today. The future of any organisation can be found in the growth of the people who are a part of it, especially those who lead it. So I want you to think about the future of your organisation and that's why you're here. The future of your organisation is about the growth and development who are a part of it, but especially you as the leaders of the organisation. So that's essentially why we're here. Um, I'm going to skip this because we kind of did that a minute ago, but I find this is a really good exercise um, f to, g to get to know people. Um, I, was gonna, I was going to uh, get you guys to introduce yourself to a stranger, find out something uh, interesting that hardly anyone knows, and uh, 
ask what they hope to get for today. But, you know, uh, as I've s sat here through the other sessions, we've, we've fundamentally covered that. Um, here's, my, uh, here's my guys. Who's got kids? Keep your hand up if you've got kids you still like. Yes, that's good. So uh, the reason I want to show you this is, um, and, and it's, it, it's been, um, it's almost like deja vu today because there's been three or four things that you'll recognise in my presentation that have actually been talked about already. And uh, Shah calls herself the Y lady. Well, this is my little Tully here. And since she's been old enough to talk, we've called her the Y girl. And the reason is, <laughs> and you, you guys, by the looks on some of your faces, the reason is uh, since Tully could talk, we would say, Tully, it's time for a bath. What would she say? Why? Uh, Tully, come up to um, the table, it's time for dinner. Why? Tully, um, put some sunscreen and a hat on, we're going outside. Why? Right? Um, so um, as I uh, make fun of Tully to the rest of my family, my beautiful 82-year-old mother um, smiles and says to me, yes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Because apparently that's exactly what I was like as a kid. The reason I'm telling you this is that I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are sitting here thinking to yourselves, why is it important that I become a better leader? And I think that's healthy. I, I actually want you to think about what, what difference would it make if, to my organisation if I was a better leader. Now, what I'd like you to do is reach out in front of you. I've got two handouts there. Um, I want you to grab the four-page handout because I'm going to get you to do an exercise right now. And this kind of overlaps with some of the stuff that you've done, but I, I think you'll get some clarity out of that. What I want you to do is I want you to give some... And we'll have a bit of thinking music here, probably just for about two minutes. But I want you to think about what difference would it make to your business if you were a better leader. So I'm looking for maybe, and I'm just looking for dot points here, I'm looking for maybe three to five dot points. What difference would it make to your organisation if you were a better leader? We might have a bit of thinking music there, Megan. So when you've got a couple, I want you to turn to the person next to you and just compare notes. What difference would it make to your organisation if you were a better leader? So just as Steve, thank you Megan, just as Steve has had you guys do regularly today, I, I want to get a bit of a feel for, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some whispers and I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there's um, uh, pretty good agreeance around the room, but um, Patrick, what did you come up with mate? So here's a really interesting thing, and Steve would probably know this, but in uh, Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, he, he, he said that what most, why most people start their business, uh, their own business, is to have more money, more freedom and more um, time. And, um, and, you know, I'm sure Steve says this to a lot of people, how's that working out for you? Not really. So Patrick tells us if he's going to be a better leader, the business can grow, his people can grow and develop, and the other one was? Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe from this table here. Mossy, what did you come up with? Yeah, yeah. So uh, lead by example, and if you you break the processes, you're setting a bad example for others. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, over here, big loud voice. For pretty good reasons. What about this table in the middle here? Someone. Anyone? What difference is it going to make to your business or your organisation if you're better leaders? Yes. Yes. We're going to cover that in a minute, but that, that's an absolutely great insight to why we want to become better leaders. And, and maybe one or two people from up at the back table. So would you guys agree that they are all compelling reasons about why we should become better leaders? Yeah. Um, I've, um, I've got a few theories myself. And um, one of the reasons, and it, to me, there's three really important areas. Um, the first one is results. Uh, and some of you covered those results. Um, a little bit of research from the University of New South Wales, a study they did a, a couple of years ago. Um, they looked at 90 different organisations, small, medium and large, and across a wide range of industry sectors. They used 12 performance criteria to measure the performance of the organisations. They looked at the very best and some would say the very worst. They compared the two and they said, what is the difference in Australia between succeeding and not succeeding? And not surprisingly, the performance of the leader was the clear winner. Leaders in uh, high-performing workplaces made the biggest difference. And, and uh, just a, a couple of really quick details. They found that leaders in high-performing workplaces had a clear, shared vision for the organisation. Clear, because everyone understood it. Shared, because everyone understood it. Uh, leaders in high-performing workplaces also demonstrated clear and consistent values. So people knew what they were getting into. Um, leaders in high performing workplaces all also invested more time and effort in the growth and development of their people. And Patrick, you mentioned that. Leaders in high performing workplaces praised, recognised and encouraged their people more. And lastly, leaders in high performing workplaces welcomed criticism. So they weren't afraid to say to their people, how do you think I'm going? So... There's really compelling evidence that better leaders produce better organisational outcomes. To me, this one is really important, and we, we've um, talked about this. Leaders, uh, better leaders drive better engagement and better culture. And again, a, a little bit of uh, research here. Um, the largest study ever done into leadership in Australia was done by the um, uh, Melbourne University. It was called the Study of Australian Leadership. Um, what they found was engagement, culture and trust are strongly and directly linked to leadership. Now, this was 9,000 employees and managers across 3,000 organisations. A really robust study that absolutely slam dunked that argument that leadership drives culture and engagement. And to me, um, one of the most important things in an organisation is about how engaged the people are because fundamentally, engagement means happiness. Um, I've coined a phrase, care factor. What is the care factor of your people? Who's heard anyone say care factor zero? It's kind of pretty sad, particularly when you hear that in a workplace, right? Well, um, when the care factor is high, people care and they're engaged. But to me... Probably the number one thing is that I know that when we can encourage and help people to be better leaders, they actually become better people. We become better partners, we become better parents, we become better members of the community, we certainly become better bosses. 
So there are really compelling reasons about why uh, we should all strive to become uh, better leaders. It's about results and the number one thing that drives results is culture. And guess what the number one thing that drives culture is? It's leadership. And I, to me, there's a, a direct and linear relationship to those three things. We all want better results, whether our organisations are not-for-profit or for-profit, whether our organisations are public sector or private sector. We all want better results across those areas. Culture drives results and leadership drives culture. Incredibly important. Now, I'm going to make a confession here. Um, I'm a, an unashamed Newcastle Knights fan. Um, yeah, I know. Um, and, um, and I've already got the collection of wooden spoons, right? 2015, 16 and 17. I don't want any more. I've got the full collection. And uh, so what's happening in Newcastle at the moment, um, you might know that we, you know, we went through a very hard time. We've got new owners and a new coach. Coach. So what's happening is in order to get better results, they're driving a better culture through the organisation and that's absolutely happening on the back of, of the leadership of the organisation and the ownership of the organisation. Um, we haven't won a game this year yet because you know, we actually placed in Georgia Illawarra in a trial on, uh, on Saturday night. Um, but, uh, West Tigers. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, better leadership. You might have heard, and, and this is, the, I guess this is the first time I want to acknowledge, I don't know how many times Steve and Shah have said better, um, and, and this is a concept that I'm absolutely passionate about. Um, better doesn't mean perfect, it just means better. I think if we, uh, we try and set ourselves up to be perfect leaders, we're going to fail. And I talk to my clients and the people that I deal with about being committed to continuous improvement in terms of being better today than we were yesterday, to being better tomorrow than we were today. And this, this whole concept of better is incredibly important. Um, have we got any sports fans in the room? Yeah, about half of you. I'm absolutely passionate about most sports. Who can tell me um, the number one the most successful sporting team or franchise in the world over the last 10 years. It's the New Zealand All Blacks. Um, there's a fantastic book called Legacy um, about you know, a couple of heads are nodding. Um, going back around 15 years, the All Blacks were on a slide. They had a rotten culture in the organisation. This is all covered in the book Legacy. And around about uh, 12 years ago, they, they um, had a crisis meeting, um, a few of the key stakeholders got their heads together and said, what are we going to do to rebuild the All Blacks? And they started to talk about two things, culture and becoming better. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, tying this story into the, another Newcastle Knights story, um, one of the coaches for the All Blacks um, visited Newcastle at, at the invitation of uh, Nathan Brown, the coach. And um, a journalist from the Newcastle Herald said to him, what is it about the All Blacks? What, what is the special source that has made the All Blacks the most successful sporting franchise in the world bar none? And the answer was simply, and this is exactly what he said, we are committed to being better. So every training session we try and be better than the one before. Every game we look at what we did before and we strive to be better. Um, every campaign that we go into... Uh, we want to be better than before. So this is, a, to me, better is a really, really powerful concept. Forget it, perfect, and let's focus on becoming better. So um, just before I uh, hook into a few of, of the other things that I'm passionate about, I, I just wanted, is that cutting in and out? Okay, all right. Um, I wanted to give you a bit of an I'm going to cover in the next, uh, the, the rest of this session, the session after, after afternoon tea. So at the moment I'm, I'm talking to you about a couple of philosophical issues, if you like, and certainly better is one of those. We're then going to go into workshop mode and I'm going to get you guys to work hard and we're going to use those um, handouts on, on the uh, tables there. But essentially I'm going to get you to talk, well, we are going to work on uh, four things that are simple, practical, straightforward 
parts of leadership. So what I'm doing now is talking to you about some philosophical things around leadership, of which better is one of them. But w in a moment, we're going to go into workshop mode and we're going to cover four really key elements of becoming better leaders. Because I really want you to guys to leave here today with some really practical stuff that you can put in place. I think Shah said it. Um, having a good chat and hearing some good stories is great. But unless we take some action, nothing changes. So the four things that we're going to talk about are, are you leading or are you managing? And I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but I've got um, a piece around that that will probably confront you a little bit around which one you're doing. Um, most people who do this exercise kind of go, oh, damn, I thought I was leading, but I'm mainly managing, and I really need to understand the difference. Um, I don't know if anyone is um, good at having difficult conversations, but in my experience, being a leader means we have to have a series of dif difficult conversations. And I've got a methodology around that um, that can help you um, plan for and have effective difficult conversations. There's a great little technique for increasing um, reliability and trust in your team, and it's called a say-do ratio. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay, it's a beautifully simple little exercise that I'm going to take you through. And it's all, all of this stuff you can go back to your teams whenever it is that you go back to your teams and put these things in place and, and start to see a difference in terms of your own leadership but also in the performance of your teams. And the last one, and this was, a, I guess, a key theme in the, in the promotion um, of this workshop of these two days, and that was effective delegation. I'm hoping that I've got time to do it. We're going to do this one now and we're going to do these three in the next uh, hour and a bit. Um, and I've got a handout about how to effectively delegate because in my experience, and I deal with everything from supervisors right up to managing directors and CEOs, even of publicly listed companies, most people are doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. And, uh, we, yep, Steve's head is nodding. And uh, so I've got a really effective little um, mechanism that helps you get stuff off your plate, but at the same time it helps people step up. So uh, I guess I'm giving you a heads up, I'm going to be unashamedly practical about what you can do in order to walk away and become better leaders. Is that okay with you guys? Awesome. So um, let me let me get back to this philosophical piece. Um, and again, uh, Steve, as he wrote up your thoughts and as he pulled one word out, actually stole my thunder. I want you to talk, talk to the t turn to the person next to you, and I want you to come up. And I know you did this earlier, but it'll be interesting to see if anything's changed. I want you to come up with three or four um, finishes to this sentence. Leadership is dot dot dot. Do that now. It's on your hand, the front of your handout. So has everyone got three or four? I'll be interested to see if they're the same ones that you guys covered with Steve this morning. I won't be surprised if they are. So because I do what I do, a lot of people say to me, um, hey, Mr. Leadership Guy, what's your definition of leadership? And um, I, of I often turn to Professor Google. Uh, in, on, on this occasion, I typed in just simply into a Google search definition of leadership. There, would anyone like to have a guess at how many search results I got when I submitted that? What do you reckon, Mark? Yeah, that's a big number, isn't it? What about 304 million search results? Absolutely true. That's a screenshot of my search, right? So they can't all be right and they can't all be wrong. I'm, I want to hear, and I'll appreciate it if you can sort of uh, a little be a bit louder than you've been before, but every table, give me two or three. Leadership is? Role model, yep, good. Good. Definitely it's all about the team. This table here? Yes, there you go. Stolen my thunder. This table here? One or two? Trust, absolutely. Empowering, setting direction. Back table? Yes, absolutely. And down here? Yes, good. All good. And I agree with all of that stuff. And I also agree with all of the stuff that was up on the page today. Now, this is the first time I've ever... Uh, Steve, you're, you're very in tune, uh, young man... Uh, it's the first time that I've ever seen this, this exercise done. 
earlier, stole, stealing my thunder, where, where, where um, positive influences come out. And um, that's exactly the definition that I wanted to highlight with you today. And Steve, do you know where that's c that comes from? I <laughs> you obviously steal a lot of p other people's stuff and don't acknowledge it. It, 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 it. Things come from more than one source, I acknowledge that. But it, come, it actually comes from a book um, called The Leader Who Had No Title by Robin Sharma. He's a Canadian author. Um, and in his book, he talks about you don't have to have a title. You don't have to be high on the organisational chart to be a leader. In fact, when you think about it, all of the things that you mentioned this morning and the things that you just mentioned now, they're all about positive influence. And I, I saw your thinking, Steve, when you listed all that stuff and you said, well, you know what, all of that is influence, isn't it? And there was some talk about is it positive or negative influence? Well, to me, leadership is, a, is all about positive influence. So can, I want you to think about what would it be like in your organisation if enough people bought into this, they didn't leave leadership up to you or they didn't just leave leadership up to people who are high on the org chart. If you started to have conversations around, can we positively influence each other? What I'm talking about there is your peers. So the people at the same level of the organisation to you, are you a positive influence on them? Certainly the people that report through to you, are you positively influencing them? And you mentioned before about um, leading upwards. We can be a positive influence on the people that we report to. to so to me, it's a, it's a game-changing concept. If we think about leadership being positive, positive influence, and, and if, we, um, if we engage in that concept and think to ourselves, I'm not really leading unless I'm positively influencing others. To me, it's, a, it's an absolute game-changing concept and it's one that I hope you can take forward from today. The Leader Who Had No Title by Robin Sharma. Like the guy in this photo here, he, he's sort of a little bit perplexed and saying, Manage, am I managing or leading? Don't they mean the same thing? Isn't it just semantics? Aren't they just words? Here's a couple of memes from social media and up the top there we can see boss and boss is up high. And I suppose he or she, I guess you could be, um, you could argue that they're providing direction or providing motivation. They're pointing in the direction and they're saying go. And uh, down the bottom there we see by contrast leader. Now leader's not up high, they're, out, they're actually out the front and they're doing some heavy lifting. And, and, and they're, they're saying let's go. And it's, and, and it's this way. And again we can smile at this and we could say look it's just a, it's a funny meme off social media or we could look at it a little bit deeper and go, you know, what do I do? Am I saying to my people, I'll oh, help do some heavy lifting? Am I being a positive influence on them? Or am I up above and um, giving direction from high up? This one's my favourite. On the left-hand side, you'll see boss. And boss has made it. Boss has made it to the top of the mountain. And they're actually giving themselves a rap and a pat on the back and saying, how awesome am I? But when we look at Boss's team, where is Boss's team? They're not quite there yet. And you know what, there'll be some collateral damage, but that's okay, isn't it? Because you know what, I've made it. And that's what it's all about, right? So over here on the right-hand side, we see leader. And you can see that leader's not there yet. They're only halfway up. But who can tell me what will be the situation when leader makes it? They'll make it as a team, right? So again, we can laugh this stuff off or we can say, you know what, is there something to this? Here's a great quote, and, and I, I guess I'm getting to the finer point of managing versus leading, and that is we, we manage things. We manage KPIs. We manage budgets. We manage policies and procedures. And don't get me wrong, all of those things are important, but at the end of the day, we lead people. Does that make sense to you guys? John Quincy Adams. Does anyone know who John Quincy Adams was? Anyone um, a buff on uh, American history? He's actually a, a past president of the United States. He was uh, the sixth president of the United States um, from 1825 to 1829. An interesting but little known fact is his dad, John Adams, was the second president of the United States. Now you might be thinking I'm taking a risk by quoting presidents of the United States. Well, these are obviously past ones. Now this is a bit of a long quote but... 
this absolutely speaks to me about what a leader is. Let me unpack it for you. If your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more and become more, well, then you're a leader. Now, let's unpack it a little bit. If your actions, not just your words, if your actions inspire others, so it is about others, it's not about us, if our actions inspire others to dream more. Now, to me, that's helping people achieve their potential. It's, it's letting people know that you think that they can achieve more than they're currently achieving. If your actions inspire others to learn more, it's about growth and development. So our role as a leader is to help people learn and grow. If our actions inspire others to do more, now, that, you know, in a practical sense, that's about productivity. And lastly, if our actions inspire others to become more, to be more than they would have been on their own. Now, I'm astounded that that quote is nearly 200 years old. So I've actually reverse engineered that a little bit. I don't want you to answer this question, but as a result of your leadership... Are your people becoming more? Are they staying the same? Or are they becoming less? And I wish there was a metric in organisations that we could measure our impact as a leader in terms of how far we've taken people. Does that make sense to you? To me, that's the most important metric in an organisation. As a leader, have you helped those people that you found when you become leader? Have you helped them to, to become more? Or have they stayed the same? Hopefully they haven't become worse as a result of you. But I can tell you I've worked for leaders that I've disengaged as a result of their poor leadership. I don't know about you guys. There's a few nodding heads in the room. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, well then you're a leader. So I've actually developed a little bit of IP around this and I'm really passionate about it. I reckon leaders have just got one job and that is to make others better. If we aren't creating environments where people are engaged, if we aren't creating environments where people are striving to be better, better people, striving to pr produce better results, I don't think we're actually leading. We might be just managing. So I guess that's one of the things I want you to walk away with today and thinking, are my people becoming better as a result of my leadership? Because I know it's, it's a little bit confronting and I did a, a gig uh, just last week and uh, someone came up to me in the break and said, you know what, you can't make people do anything. I think I heard Steve say something similar to that this morning. I'm not talking about, you be better, you be better, you be faster, you be smarter. We're not talking about that at all, but we're talking about leaders who create an environment where people flourish and grow and develop and can be their best. And that, to me, is the number one job of a leader. We've got to create an environment where our people are becoming better. So I'm just going to run through quickly a, a little bit of philosophy behind the leadership development program that I founded around about 12 years ago. It's called Licence to Lead, and, and pretty much the story to that is... Um, most things that we do in our lives that are important, we have to have a licence uh, to do before, we le before we're allowed to do them. What's the obvious one? Drive a car, right? Before we're allowed to drive a car, we have to show that we've got experience, competence and we know the rules. Um, whether we're a plumber, a lawyer, a doctor, uh, w the same thing is. Before we're allowed to practice, we need a, a, a licence. Except for leading. Um, who's, who's ever been taught how to lead? Or did you find yourself kind of in the middle of it. And that's a typical story, right? Many of us haven't been taught how to lead. So the idea was, um, you know, let's provide a framework where people can become better leaders. I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I, I, wanna, I really want to get into this, pr this practical um, workshop part of it. You can see there that, that that's my leadership development um, uh, model, if you like. And um, you can see that right at the very bottom there, you can see the word manager and, and I want you to, it's symbolic, I want you to think about the, the shape of that area in which the word manager is written. And then I want, to sh want you to have a look at the shape um, or the area of the shape in, in the words highly effective leader are written. Now, 
that is symbolic in as much as that shape there is equivalent to the amount of influence that a manager has on an organisation. But by contrast, we want to become highly effective leaders. And my leadership development model, which is covered in my book and all of the programs that I do, whether they're one-on-one -on -one or in a group or whether they're a six-month leadership development program inside a corporation, it's all based on these five foundation competencies. And I'll run through them quickly with you. Vision, okay, so this is, this is scalable, but it starts with an individual. I talk to people who want to be better leaders about what is your vision for yourself as a leader in the future? And essentially that's about taking stock of where you're at now. Who's heard of a SWOT analysis? Unbelievably powerful and simple tool. So I get people to do um, a leadership SWOT analysis on, their self, on themselves. What are my strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats as a leader? Not as a person, not as a manager, but me as a leader. And then from that we project and we say, well, what's my vision as a leader if that's where I'm at now? As I said, it's scalable. What we do then is we talk to... Um, teams or groups. So who works in a team or group? Almost everyone. So as a leader, what we do is we go, let's get our team or group together. Let's engage them around a conversation. Let's say, where are we at now in terms of our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats? And let's project from that and say, well, what's our vision for the next 90 days? How can we improve? And I encourage people to keep it that simple. Now, from an organisational point of view, I also say, you know what, if you, ha if you don't have a statement of, and this goes exactly to Shah's purpose, if your organisation is not clear about its vision, it's probably lost. So again, if you can influence the organisation that you worked for, and I acknowledge that some of you probably don't have the capacity to influence the, the vision of your organisation, but where you do, you should. Here's a character from the book who's thinking to himself, what's my vision of myself as a leader in the future? How can I grow and develop my people? How can I create an environment where my people are better? The second area of um, my model is authenticity and that's essentially um, being who you say you are. Who can tell me the opposite of authentic? Yell it out. Fake. How many times do you reckon I've asked that question? Literally thousands. And within one or two seconds of me asking that, I get fake, false or phony. And if you want to know how important authenticity is in leadership, if you're, not, if, you are f if you're not being authentic, you are what? Faking it. And people do not want to line up behind you if they, if you, if they think you're a fake. We're going to cover that a little bit later on when we talk about um, the other workshops. So just like this character from the book, as a leader you say, look, I, I'm, I'm who I say I am. There's no BS about me. This is, this is who I am. The third um, foundation competency is about action. Um, quick show of hands, who's got too much time on their hands? Two of you. What's wrong with you people? Okay, uh, almost without exception when I ask that pe question, people look at me as if I've got two heads and say, what are you talking about? So that tells me that most people are operationally flat out. Would you agree with that? operationally flat out, no time. So when is it that you do the leadership stuff? Often the answer to that question is when I get time and I don't have time to do the leadership stuff so it doesn't get done. So within this area of uh, my leadership development model, we actually talk about time management. We actually talk about planning. We actually talk about a model for effective change. And they are, you know, you might argue that there's some basic things but as a time poor leader I have to help you create time to lead does that make sense the fourth area is responsibility and this is about creating a culture of accountability encouraging people to do what they say they're going to do and I'll talk about that when we talk about the say do ratio and the last area is in inspiration and that is simply I believe it's your job to lift others up it's your job to, to do whatever you can so that people can be, become better versions of themselves and that's exactly what Shah was referring to earlier. Um, so all of that stuff is, is um, in my book, The Road Rules for Leadership. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, four of those areas today, managing versus leading, doing what you say you're going to do, 
don't delay difficult conversations and um, make time to lead through delegation. So we're going to cover the last three in the next session, but we've got about uh, 20 minutes or so to, to dive deep in on this first one, and, and it's really, really important. So let me go back to this, this um, photo about this guy who's kind of thinking, like, I'm doing my best, but am I managing or leading it? Aren't they the same thing as supervisor, boss, manager, team leader? Don't they all mean the same thing? And, and I think that that's part of the problem. I think there's possibly widespread ignorance around the difference between the two. So I want to unpack that a little bit and, and help you guys reflect on it from a personal point of view. And um, we've got a little exercise in a minute that I'm not going to make any apologies because in most cases it's a little bit confronting. And, and some of you might be a little bit taken aback by, you know what, I thought I was doing my best and I thought I was doing a really good job. I, I thought I was doing what I was expected to do, but I realise I've actually got to do a little bit better or a little bit different. So let's unpack this a little bit. So workshop one, are we managing or leading? There we go, boss up the top, go, I'll sit here, but you go, you do the heavy lifting, Leader down the bottom, let's go, let's do this together. Boss on the left-hand side, it's all about me. I've made it and that's all that matters. Leader on the right-hand side, let's do this together. Let's make, make it to the top um, together. So, um, as I said, managing, and m managing is not enough, you need to lead. Is rule number one in the road rules for leadership. And fundamentally, that's because if you don't get it, nothing else matters. If you're happy just managing, the rest of this stuff really doesn't matter. So let's shine a little bit of a light on the difference between managing and leading. And I want to acknowledge um, this comes from a, a paper written a couple of decades ago by a guy called Professor Warren Bennis from the University of South Carolina. And Bennis was a, uh, a really prominent, well, he still is a prominent Back then, he was a, um, a management researcher. And at one stage, he wrote a paper that said, you know what, we shouldn't be researching management, we should be researching leadership. And you know what his peers said to him? His peers said, don't be silly, they're the same thing. And he said, that's the problem. And I'll show you why that's the problem. So I'm going to show you a slide, and it's just got dot points. And I'm going to talk to each one of them. But hopefully, it'll expand your thinking about what is the difference between managing and leading. And as we go through this, I really want to encourage you guys to think about your own situation. Try and personally reflect on which one am I doing. And by the way, guys, this is not a test. There's no right or wrong. And in a lot of cases, what you're doing is probably what you've been told to do and probably what you're expected to do. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to talk about the things that Bennis says managers do. And by contrast, on the right-hand side, we're going to talk about the things that Bennis says leaders do. And I want to say up front, we're not saying that the stuff on the left isn't important. In fact, the stuff on the left is vital if you want to run a successful organisation. But my point is it's not enough. And we need to extend ourselves over onto the right. So let's go. Who thinks administration is important in a business? Can I see all your hands up, please, because it's bloody important. Okay, we've got to comply, we've got to pay our taxes, we've got to pay super, we've got to pay the people that we owe money to. Um, so we've actually got to do this administration. But by contrast, Bennis says, you know what, the leader actually innovates. Now, as a business consultant, and m some of you would, if you work in this space, you would know this, Typically what I do when I go into an organisation is I walk around and ask questions. And one of the questions I typically ask is, why do you do it that way? What's the most common answer I get back? That's the way it's always been done, right? So in this case, what Bennis is saying is the manager complies. The manager follows systems and procedures because that's the way we've always done it. But by contrast, the leader says, you know what? Is there a way for us to be innovative about this? Is there a smarter, better, faster way we could do the same thing? So really, what the first point there is that the leader is asking questions. The leader is actually challenging and saying, is this the right way to do it, rather than just following procedure? We're not talking about change for change's sake. 
We're talking about people who question and people have a desire for better. The second point Venice makes is that managers are often a copy. Who's got policy and procedures manuals at your organisation? You've probably got them coming out of your intranet, right? <coughs> um, so what he's really saying is here, if we can capture the corporate knowledge in an organisation, we put it in a document or we put it on an intranet, as one manager comes out, we get another one in and we can just say, you know what, just be a copy of the last one. Just implement those policies and procedures and we'll be all good. And by contrast, um, Bennis says, you know what, that's not good enough. We want an original thinker. We want someone who comes in and says, well, I'm not going to copy the last person or I'm not going to just do what has always been done. I actually want to maybe put my own stamp on this. So already after two points, you can start to see a trend here, the difference between managers and leaders. And again, I want to challenge you to think, what am I doing? Third one is the manager maintains. Now, I reckon maintaining, what might, be, what might we maintain in an organisation? The status quo. We might maintain the status quo because that's kind of smooth sailing. Okay, keep the ship on an even keel. Let's make today the same as it was yesterday. Let's make tomorrow the same as it was today. So let's maintain because it's comfortable when we, we've got smooth sailing, right? Whereas by contrast, the, the leader goes, nah, we don't want to maintain. We want to develop. We want to develop our range of product or s products or services. We want to develop our people. We don't want them to be the same as they were last month. Um, let's develop a new market. Let's maybe diversify. Let's maybe uh, move into another geographic area. And that's what growth is about. So rather than just maintain, the leader goes, no, 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 we want better. So you're starting to see a trend here, the difference between managers and leaders. Next one is systems. And, you know, I think systems are really, really important in an organisation. And I'm sure that Steve talks to you guys about that. Um, some of, you know, some... Um, Young organisations, the first thing they've got to do is get some systems in place so, that, you know, things don't um, fall through the cracks. And I think that's really important. But you know what the leader does? The leader focuses on people. We put systems in place because 80% of the stuff that we do, we do over and over and over again. So we put a system in place and just let it look after itself. And then we focus on the variables and they, they're the people, typically. Sometimes a manager will rely on control, the, uh, the, the authority that their position gives them. So typically a manager can make someone do something because, you know, oh, it can make your life difficult if you, if you don't do what I ask you to do. Whereas, you know, what a leader does, a leader inspires trust by the quality of their, the relationship that they have. This is all on page two if you haven't already picked it up. Um, to some extent, we've all got to have a short-range view. I'm sure that when we break, you know, you turn your phones on, you'll see messages and emails. Uh, tonight, you'll probably think about what, you know, after what you've got to do next week as a result of being here for two days. But you know what? The leader has a long-range view. The leader's going, what have I got to do this quarter? What have I got to do this six months? What have I got to do this year? But this last one absolutely nails it for me. Who can tell me what the bottom line means in any organisation? Money? Okay, I, I, would, I would use the term financial sustainability. Okay, so, you know, when we look at a P&L, often we're looking down at an Excel spreadsheet, or we're looking down at Xero or QuickBooks or Myob, and we're looking and saying, were we fin financially sustainable last quarter? Did more money come in that went out? And that's the bottom line. But guess where the leader's eyes are? On the horizon. Who can tell me? what we're looking for or at if our eyes are cast towards the horizon as opposed to down at an Excel spreadsheet. What are we looking for or at? Long term what? Opportunity, absolutely. What else? Threats, so the opposite of opportunity. If, we don't, if we're not careful about what's coming at us, now that might be a competitor or it might be government legislation might be increased compliance. It might be the changing um, uh, expectations of our customers. So that one absolutely nails it for me. So a manager's eyes have got to be on the bottom line. And thank goodness that they are right. We've got to have our eyes down on the bottom line to make sure we're not going broke. But by contrast, we've also got to have our eye on the horizon. What else is coming at us? 
You manage things, you lead people. So I want you to um, have a look on page two, the bottom of page two. And this is probably, uh, I think I can say this with, or well, halfway down page two, this is probably um, a concept that you haven't done before. But I want you to think about what is my ratio currently of managing versus leading? Thinking back to what Bennis says about managing versus leading. And then I want you to think about what would I like it to be in the future? Now, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. First of all, I don't want there to be any comparison in the room. I don't want, I don't want you to be encumbered by, um, will this... Will, will this um, shape up to someone else's expectation in the room. I don't want there to be any of that. Um, and I don't want... It, it's not a test that you can pass or fail. It's a really, really important reflective piece around what am I currently doing, managing versus leading? But if I could make a change, and fundamentally that's what today's about, if I could make a change, what would I like it to be in the future? Managing versus leading. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. So write those two ratios down and then I want you to, to talk to the person next to you about what those ratios are and what you'd like it to be in the future. Lee. So the second part of this exercise, and I'll, I'll get you to do this reasonably quickly as I flick back to this slide. The second part of that question is, here are some things that I'd like... Here are some things that I know I need to do to be a more effective leader in the future. So, regardless of what your ratio is now and regardless of what you'd like it to be in the future, what has that reflection told you about? Because we've talked about we manage things, we lead people. We've talked about if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, become more, you're a leader. I've said to you, to me, the number one responsibility of a leader is to make others better. And then Bennis has gone, here's what I reckon a manager does and here's what I reckon a leader does. And then I've forced you to go, what are you doing most of? Or what, 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 are, the, what are the proportions? So the most important thing is that dot point. Let's not worry about the bottom one. Um, if we had time, I'd do that. But the first dot point there, here's some things that I know I need to do to be a more effective leader in the future. You've got about two minutes to do that and then we're going to come back and I'm going to ask you for some suggestions around what did you get out of that last bit. About two minutes. So, so one of the uh, rules in my book is make time to lead and we talk about time management and some people have said to me in the past, oh, time management is such a basic thing. Why are you talking to leaders about it? Can you see the irony there? A leader's time is more valuable than anyone else's in the organisation, yet they are usually the busiest people. So one of the things that I nearly put up here was a, a really simple practical approach to time management and managing priorities, but it's in the book. Um, I, just by virtue of I had to pick four and we'll be struggling to get through four. But yeah, time making time to lead, super important. Michael. And um, that was consistent with what Shah got out of you earlier as well. And when you do, it'll be incredibly powerful. Yep. Good. So more focus. Have you got shiny object syndrome? You know what that is? I'm working on something and it's really exciting and it's really good. Oh, wow, well, look at that over there. That's better. I'll get back to that later. Work on, you know, I'm working on this. It's really good. Oh, look at that over there. Sound like you? A little bit? Not that bad. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I might have overplayed the hand there a little bit. Mossy? So that goes to your why, doesn't it? If you're doing something you don't care about, there's a fair chance your care factor will be low. So maybe what Shah talked about earlier is really important for you. Yeah, look, we're going to get there in a second and it's really powerful but we've got to delegate more, 100% and I'll tell you why. Mark. Good, super important. Andrew? Yes, what would you say? Yes, 100%. And again, it's a distraction, time management, focus, vision, all of that. Patrick? Um, understanding my leadership style. Style? 
Yeah, good. Doing a SWOT is really important, but there's some other tools that you could use, like DISC, and there's a bunch of other stuff like that where you can really understand how other people perceive you. Super important. Yep. Yes. Yes, that's interesting. Yes. So I'm going to use a concept that Shah raised with you. Perhaps you're in the wrong role. I just wanted to go on record. If she leaves, it's on your head, Shah, not mine, right? I just reinforced. Yes. It's a trap though, isn't it? hard. We're going to talk about it a little bit later on, particularly when it comes to delegation. One of the, one of the reasons why we don't delegate is because they won't do it as good as us. So we just do it ourselves, right? Yeah. A few head, look at all the heads nodding. Yep. Yeah. Fundamentally important. Yep. Good. Good. Sometimes people don't communicate their vision clearly because they don't have one and they need to get one. Up the back. Yep. Yeah, then you fix it for them, right? So that creates a problem for you, creates a problem for them. Yeah, we're going to cover that. Yep. Awesome. Good stuff. It's a balance, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, good. Excellent. Okay, so to finish off, um, Shah mentioned Simon Sinek. I'm a massive fan. If you haven't watched, I, mean, I think he's got about four of the uh, top ten most watched TED Talks uh, in history. Uh, I say this to all of my clients. Uh, TED Talks take lo how long? 18 minutes at the very longest. What you've got to do is you've got to, you know, get, get one of Simon Sinek's TED Talks up on your monitor. You get three or, three or four of your staff sitting around it. You spend 18 minutes watching it. You spend the next 20 minutes saying, what's this mean for us? And um, I wanted to finish off this session on this quote here. Um, I want you to think about being the leader that you wish you had. Because I, when I look back at my career and I think, nah, I had some stinkers. And, and, I, and I wish they did that for me and I wish they cared for me and I wish they were focused on making me better. So that speaks to me. Be the leader you wish you had. Thanks, guys. I'll see you after the break. Awesome. Big round of applause for Greg. Thank you very much.